Hey, what's up my fellow mutants and welcome back to Seek at Night. Check this out. This is a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive from this year, Upper Deck, sold only at their booth. And they did a lot of cool other things at their booth. They took your picture and put you on a card. They had Star Wars Unlimited cards that were rare and you could only get there as well. But I asked a friend, very kind friend of mine, to go and pick one of these up if they were able to. And they didn't just get me one. They got Blue a pack as well, which I said, you did not have to do that. Blue is, uh, he, you know, he's more into the Moon Knight stuff and everything. And I don't even know if he watched X-Men 97. So I don't think he did, actually. So to me, I'm like, you didn't have to do that. But my friend insisted. They say, he's like, hey, I got in line. That was the hard part. I got there on preview night and I was able to pick one up. And I said, you know what? Screw it. I'll get two of them. These are 25 bucks a pop. And each pack comes with a full set of cards. So there's 16 cards in each pack, just like the one we did before where we opened up this series. And this had like 16 cards in it. The last card is a parallel, a rare parallel of one of the first 15 cards. And that's what it is in this. So we're going to open this pack here on this episode. And we're going to talk a little bit about X-Men 97 and give you my final thoughts. Because I never did do a full review of the last five episodes. But I'm not going to get into spoilers here. I'm just going to tell you overall what I felt about each episode as we come across characters and their moments that they had in those final episodes. So... Without further ado, I'm nervous. <laughs> Let's open this pack. The other pack we're going to open in a short, and I'll just kind of fly through them, and we'll basically just try to work our way to see what the hit is. So, starting with, and I think I just revealed <laughs> who our last card was, uh, but there's two versions of them, so there's we'll see what we get. Uh, but we got the team lineup. That's the first card. Great shot. And like I said, the show, the last episode we reviewed, I think was five, or you know, what happened on Genosha. So the episodes after that were really great because there was a lot of, you know, focus on the grief part. And they took their time with that in the show. And I was really surprised that they did that. And I thought it made the show really relatable. And it really pulled me in even more than the show already had me at. So getting through that and going through the grief and seeing life death, you know, translated from the comics into the show with Storm and Forge was amazing. And I, I really love that. And then the whole finale building up Bastion and doing Zero Tolerance was just epic. Like they did such a good job. And then still putting in the Asteroid M moment with Wolverine and Magneto and the Adamantium, just top notch. And check this out on the back of each card. They got a little bit of prose here, so you can see uh, where they kind of list all the characters and a little bit about them. So really awesome. The show's premise was really neat. You know, Xavier went missing or was taken off planet to heal. They did a whole episode on him realizing the X-Men are in danger and coming back to Earth and revealing that maybe the mutants lied to the public. And just as they were starting to get sympathy on their side, it started to turn and really, really well done the way that show handles, you know, that kind of stuff. It's It was really awesome. Uh, looking forward to season two for sure. Standout character, this Cyclops just really rocked it in this show. And I'm really glad they did that to that character because I think he needed it. Like the poor guy in the comics... Uh, for a while now has been kind of languished in my opinion and it was cool to see him done so well and then in the live action movies they didn't ever did too too much with him either and uh and by the time they started to it was those prequel movies and they were already you know losing people's interest unfortunately so Jean Grey really great what they did with her and Madeline in the show this season Wolverine I thought they utilized really well they didn't make him the main focus I love that the movies do that because I love Hugh Jackman but, um, by the way, go see Deadpool Wolverine. It's awesome. Uh, and our review will come up very soon. I'm just waiting a while because I'm going to talk about spoilers. So, uh, but don't any, none in the comments, please. We'll save, save them for that episode. Uh, but we'll just talk X-Men 97 here. But what they do with Wolverine in this is very much like what the Astonishing X-Men run did, where it's just kind of like, Wolverine's like, what do you want me to do? You came up with this plan on how to fight Sentinels and stuff. What do you want me to do? And Cyclops like, um, have a beer. I don't know. Like, we'll call you when we need you. You know, and that's kind of how Wolverine is. In this show, there was no episode fully focused just on him, and I kind of like that. But I think they're saving that for season two, though, especially with where they leave him at the end of this season. Uh, Remy, great card, very awesome. Another great moments with him in this. Um, you know, in the first five episodes, they did uh, they squeezed in a lot, even though they had an overall story going. They did a lot with him and Rogue, and Rogue and Magneto, and kind of that whole dynamic. And I thought what they did was really awesome, and you know, but. When are goodbyes ever goodbye in comic books, you know? So I can't wait to see, you know, Apocalypse and everything in the next season. And another awesome character this season, Rogue. Character who's always been one of my favorites. Her, Storm a little bit more than Rogue, but Rogue right under Storm as far as, like, my favorite of the characters on the team. And 
uh, she's just really cool. And the way they did her and how they she struggled with these feelings. And, you know, it, they that's always been a running thing with Rogue. Like, I want to touch people, but I'll kill them. I could hurt them. And what do I do with that? And I think uh, the show handled it really, really well um, of like retreading that, but in a, an interesting way. Uh, I won't say a new way, but at least an interesting way. Um, yeah, they did a really good job. And the voice acting is top notch in this show. Uh, Beast, awesome. Another character that was just kind of in the background, but showed up when the story dictated it and always made an impact. So really, really dug that character. I liked when he took control of the the Sentinel in one of the early episodes and used it to like, you know, as like a mech to fight the other Sentinels. Uh, really awesome. Just really cool character. Ah, my queen. Storm, amazing character. My favorite version of her is going to, you know, may surprise some of you, may not. I love her with the Mohawk. The show did a good job doing kind of a version of that. I love the life death storyline with her and Forge and the comics. Always been one of my favorites. Really tragic. I love that comic um, where, you know, he gives her a shot to choose him or the X-Men and she wants to choose him and she's going to, but he believes in his head, you know, guys get like this sometimes or people do in relationships where he thinks, no, she's not going to pick me and I shouldn't have given her that ultimatum. I'm a bad person, I guess, and I'm going to just walk away. And so he leaves thinking she's going to choose the X-Men and turns out she was going to choose him, but he ended up leaving her instead. So then she went back to the X-Men. Really good two-part comic book, Barry Windsor Smith artwork, phenomenal. Um, but my favorite version of Storm is Bloodstorm from Mutant X. Uh, that comic book was really cool and it's Storm as a vampire and she's so awesome looking. She's so cool. Uh, and I think there's a toy of her coming out soon as well. Magnus. Oh, Eric Lyncher. Really awesome. Loved what they did with him in the show, especially in the last couple episodes where he got captured and then he got freed um, by, I think it was Val Cooper, right? Who's uh, working for the government and turns out to be a, like an agent for um, Bastion. And that whole Bastion story, I thought they nailed that. They made him way more interesting than I remember him being in Zero Tolerance. Um, all I remember about Zero Tolerance really is that there were Sentinels on every street corner or that was, no, that was Onslaught. So I don't remember that. Uh, what I remember is like uh, Wolverine had, or Cyclops had like a bomb in his heart or something, or Wolverine did. <laughs> I can't even remember. Maybe I don't remember that book that well. I do remember that it ended with Iceman being the one who uh, defeated Bastion. So I like what they did in this show and how they tied Bastion's origin to the previous X-Men cartoon and with his mom being a character that was shown in an earlier episode. Um, really cool way to bring that full circle and make that matter with the time travel story with Storm and Wolverine. So um, so with Magneto, though, him having that big moment at the end with him and Wolverine and, uh, oh, man, so gut-wrenching, like literally, I guess. Although Magnus survived, I'm really surprised how he did that. I guess we'll find out in the next season when they're stuck in ancient Egypt. My absolute favorite X-Man uh, is Lucas Bishop here. I really like his story. I like this guy who is literally a soldier. Uh, he's a cop from the future um, in one version of his future, um, but he's part of this task force and they believe that everything goes to crap. And the reason their world has gone to crap is because there was a traitor on the X-Men and he believes he knows who it is. So he goes back in time to try to kill Gambit and it turns out Gambit was not the traitor. And I don't want to say who, because if you haven't read those comics yet, they might touch on that next season on the show. And uh, because now we have Bishop back near the end with Forge, and it looks like he's going to be on that mission of fixing things and finding the X-Men through time. So I'm, I think he's going to play a bigger part in the next season. So I'm very, very excited to see where his journey goes because he's an amazing character. And I love the moment he had when the, you know, when they fought all the demons in the first season and he absorbed Cyclops' blast and just shot all of them down. Uh, really cool. Another character that is very underrated, but I love what they did with her in the show. I love her look. I've always been a big fan of her look. Um, she's an annoying character at times. I get that. Uh, but that adds some nice levity and, uh, I guess, diversity on the team as far as personalities. You know, where she's a very different than most of the other team, even some of the other teenagers on some of the other teams, like Generation X and stuff. And that's really where I kind of fell in love with the character more was, okay, she's cool and she has this great arc that they're building and she's learning how to maybe become a leader. And they did a lot of cool stuff with her in this show with her and uh, Roberto Costa, you know, um, Sunspot. And like everything they're doing with them is is really awesome. And I can't wait to see where that goes in the next season too. And hey, there's more. Someone who admitted their love for Wolverine at the end of this show. Um, but Wolverine didn't reciprocate. You know, they've kind of teased at this before where Morph, because Morph can become anybody, it's really hard for Morph to kind of pick a 
I guess, a gender or, you know, or even just even have an interest in picking one and just being themselves, but still feeling how they feel about certain people. And I think with Morph, like Morph was always friends with Wolverine all the way back to the first episode of the cartoon, at least not in the comics so much, but in the cartoons. And so when Morph died, Wolverine took it really hard and tried to do a bunch of things to like make it right. uh, And then ended up not being able to until they found him under the control of Mr. Sinister. So now that he's broken free, they gave him a lot of cool moments with him in this series, especially with Sinister back. But I kind of like that, like where he's like, you know what? I'm, I'm, this guy's my friend, but I love him. And he's not going to probably feel the same way about me back, but I still feel like if in case he dies, I want to tell him. And I don't know. I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I thought it was fitting for this version of the character. And um, and it added a little bit of tragedy to him because it's like one of those comic book things where some characters just never get what they actually want. And there's some tragedy to that because there's something relatable about that too. Sometimes in life, you don't always get what you want. So yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was cool. I liked it. And then, hey, there's Roberto Costa. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I like that they put him in here and that they made him a teenager and that they are building like a friendship and possible relationship with him and Jubilee and stuff. I guess it's not possible. I think they kissed actually at one point. So all of that, you know, they're, they're doing really well. And he's a neat character and he's very powerful. He's like Iceman where you don't realize how powerful they are until they really cut loose. And I think, you know, we've seen a little bit of that in this show. But I think next season, hopefully, we'll see more of that. I'm hoping. And dude, look at this nasty bastard. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sinister, never seen in live action, but uh, hopefully we will at some point. I would love to see, you know, who would portray him. I know John Hamm at some point, people were trying to fan cast him, but a really neat character, very devious in this show. And really by the end of the show, hated his guts. I really wanted him destroyed once and for all, but I feel like he's going to play a, a bigger part moving forward. And um, and his his origins go way back to like pre-Tesla, like all the way back to, oh man, I don't know, like 1400s, 1500s, maybe, maybe 1600s, somewhere in that era, those hundreds of years. And, uh, and he's always been interested in mutated humans and, uh, you know, and, and has played a role since. So he's a very old, old character and he keeps, you know, rebuilding and cloning himself to perfect, you know, new versions of him. But this keeps happening to him where he's just looks more and more sinister uh so maybe that's his plan all along but yeah it's a neat very very cool character and some of my favorite mindless characters sentinels um these things are awesome we got the figurines of these the titan hero ones where they're like you know 12 inches tall and then we get the four inch x-men figures and the scale's pretty close it's not perfect but it's pretty close for the price point and stuff and uh, and they released some Marvel Legends Sentinel two packs, like Prime Sentinel st- size ones that kind of look like the ones from the video game, uh, which is cool. And uh, there's just so many versions of Sentinels. There's Prime Sentinels. There's you know Nimrod. There's Bastion. There's this. There's Master Mold. Like there's there's so many cool things. But one of the oldest comic books I I owned at one point, um, besides some of the early Fantastic Four issues, was the first appearance of the Sentinels in the X Men comics. I ended up having to sell it to pay medical bills and stuff at one point, but. Um, always been a big fan of these types of characters. They're like the stor- stormtroopers of the X Men universe, except these ones I think do a lot more damage than stormtroopers do. <laughs> they are they are way more lethal than stormtroopers. So if you're gonna have an army of like robot grunts, having them be like you know two three stories tall is you, <laughs> sends a message for sure. And then last but not least, our hit card, which I saw at the beginning, but hopefully I edited that out so you don't see it. We have here. Boom! We got Beast. How awesome. He looks so good. And so, yeah, this is one of the parallels with this kind of silvery, bluish background. And then there's the other one that is gold. Um, And those are more rare, obviously. So in this pack, we got the blue slash silvery one. And I'm okay with that. It's a very nice card. And I like the character. It's perfect. Uh, He's really... it's. No, I, I don't think I would have been upset with any of the parallels in this because all these cards, all 15 of them are amazing. So now that we have this one, I'm very excited to put these in sleeves and binders and everything. And then maybe now that we have two sets uh, coming up soon, we'll have some on display. But let me know what you think of these. Like I said, they were 25 bucks, but you got the whole set and you got all 15 cards. And I think they did a tremendous job. And I'm glad they did a team shot of these. And like I said, if you were lucky enough to be at the booth at Comic-Con, this background, they would have taken your picture and put you over this and then put your name on that uh, sliver right there. And I wish I could have been there for that. That would have been awesome. And I think also Will Spertasio 
uh, the artist that was like the co-creator of Bishop, he was there also doing a signing and uh, they had a separate card with comic book artwork on it and he signed it. So it was cool that he did an event, I think on like that Friday at Comic-Con where he signed those for like an hour or two and they were very limited. So they did a really good job and they went all out on making some really cool cards and parallels and everything to have something X-Men 97 there for fans because, you know, who knows with all the rumors going around if Upper Deck will have the license long enough to make a full X-Men 97 set. And maybe that was something they realized and why they decided to focus on this cartoon for their packs for Comic-Con. But either way, whether we get more cards or not, I'm happy we got these ones and I really owe a lot to my friend who got these for us. This was amazing. I, I cannot thank you enough, dude. Between the Wolverine packs and now this, it's like above and beyond. And I'm very grateful and I'm glad I got to share all this with you guys. So let me know what you think down below and we'll keep talking about these cards down there. And I'll have a short coming out soon where we just kind of fly through these cards and we'll just look for what parallel we get in the back end of it. So be on the lookout for that very soon. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.